Our presenter today is going to be Eric Breitling, and he's going to be talking about understanding your audiogram, a guide to understanding your hearing test results. I met Eric, oh gosh, it seems like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we were working an outreach event that's an annual event for the Community Foundation of Lafayette. They host a senior symposium. And Eric had recently opened up his practice and he wanted to get closer connected to the community. And so he participated in that event and we met at that event. And ever since that auspicious meeting, we have been friends, colleagues, and Eric has been a member of our chapter. Before the pandemic, he came to every chapter meeting because he wanted to know what people with hearing loss said in general when, when we were amongst ourselves, not just what they said when they were in their office visiting him. And I always felt really fortunate that he wanted to know from us and have valued him as a friend and colleague ever since. Eric thinks that it's really important that everybody understands their audiogram because it really helps you better prepare to deal with your hearing loss, which requires an adjustment for all of us. Before we start to give Eric an idea about who's in the audience and what your experience is, we would like to ask you just a couple of questions. The first question is, do you understand your hearing test? So those of you who are on Zoom, just click raise your hand if you understand your hearing test. For those of you in the room, who understands their hearing test? Oh, so a couple people do, but they still wanted to come to make sure that what they thought they understood is what they really understood. And how many of you ask for a copy of your audiogram every time you have your hearing tested? Oh, well, in the room here, I'm feeling really grateful because everybody's raising their hand, which means that I've done a really good job of educating everybody about what I feel is important. And if you don't ask for your audiogram after every hearing test that you have, you don't have any way of tracking how your hearing has changed over time. So, you know, you think, oh, well, my hearing has gotten worse, but, and you don't have audiograms in front of you from the year before or two years before, because as a rule of thumb, everybody should get their hearing tested once a year. Just a figment of your mind, what you think. But if you have the audiogram, you can physically look at that and see what's going on. And I'm sure Eric's gonna go into depth about this, but they're the two components of your audiogram. One is just the pure tone test, and the other one is the speech recognition score. Or hearing in the tone test may not change, but your speech recognition might change. So that's up to Eric to tell you about. And so at this point in time, I'm going to introduce Eric Breitling. And while Eric comes up to the podium, um, I'm going to go ahead and activate his PowerPoint to share it. So I thought it would be a great idea to do a presentation about understanding your audiogram. I, I've found something in the way here. Oh, <laughs> I found usually with my patients, I have a private practice in Lafayette nearby. Uh, a lot of the times after I've done an exam with a patient, I'll go over the results. And when all is said and done, most of the time people say, wow, I, I never really had explained to me that way before. Usually they'd say, yeah, you have hearing loss. You need hearing aids, and that that's kind of it. And sure, that's straight to the point, but I do find that people really appreciate it when I go more in depth to give them a better understanding of what's really going on. And so that's why whenever someone schedules an exam with me at my office, the appointment slot's two hours long. It doesn't mean that we're testing for two hours. It's just to allow plenty of time for any questions we may have so that we're not rushed and we can go over everything in great detail if you'd like of course there are some people who might say well you know just give me the the main points thank you but i don't think i need to know all that information 
you're understanding your audiogram and related things because there's more to a hearing test than just the audiogram alone. And so what I'm going to talk about today is the, the general test battery that's done. Yes, we do other tests as well, but this is just the more common type of testing that's done. It's the absolute basic that should be done whenever you are getting your hearing tested for diagnostic purposes. I put some of the symbols up there, which, oh, they're all there. They didn't get blocked. All right, next slide. So here's our agenda for today. We'll talk about the typical test battery in general and then go into the specifics of tympanometry, pure tone audiometry, speech testing, and then what once you have the results. Okay. So we'll talk about the tympanogram first. That's just a little screenshot of a, of a typical tympanogram, although there are many. So oh. it looks like it's worded funny here in my mind. I was saying why we do tympanometry, although I guess you could ask, why do we do tympanometry anyway? What's the point? And I think to get a better idea of why we do it, we should first look at the anatomy of the ear as well. And so in any case, the ear is composed of three sections. There's the outer ear, middle ear, and the inner ear. The outer ear is what we see all the way to the left. That's the, the oracle or pinna. That is where we start to capture sound already. So the, the ear is has this unique shape to funnel sound towards the external auditory canal or, uh, well, your ear canal, basically. So the size of your Oracle or pinna actually already has a uh, an amplification benefit. And that's why if you put your hand up to your ear, it's amplifying. That works quite nicely. It's not very practical. So usually if you need hearing aids in both ears, then your hands won't be free to do anything else. So hearing aids are a great alternative. So this is what I'm talking about. That's the external ear. Next part is the, well, external auditory canal, the canal. That actually plays a role too in the process. It's not just for sound passing through without anything going on. There is a resonance characteristic in there as well. And when we measure the resonance of the ear canal specifically, there is actually, in the majority of people, a boost somewhere between two to 4,000 hertz. That's right where all the speech frequencies are, or a good chunk of them are. And so the, the ear canal has a very deliberate design that is beneficial to being able to hear because more than anything else, we usually are listening to speech. So then we reach the uh, tympanic membrane, the eardrum, as you know it. The eardrum itself also has an amplification benefit too. The surface to area ratio further increases the signal that is passing from the pinna through the ear canal to hit the eardrum. What happens then is when sound hits the eardrum, it causes it to vibrate and it will then move the bones of the middle ear. So essentially, on the outer side of the eardrum is the external ear. On the inside of the eardrum is the middle ear. In the middle ear, there are a few things. There's the bony chain that connects the eardrum to the cochlea, the organ of hearing. There are three bones. The malus incus stapes, or hammer, anvil, and stirrup. Those three together further amplify the sound. So the sound keeps getting louder and louder and louder as it goes through the auditory system. And eventually what happens is it pushes on this oval. Oh, that was loud. It pushes on this oval footplate that we see right here. So the oval footplate is connected to the oval window, which is 
a part of the cochlea, the organ of hearing. As sound enters the auditory system from the external ear through the middle ear, sound as we know, or maybe as you don't, is cyclical. It's measured in frequency, which effectively is a back and forth motion. So this is plunging in and out rapidly according to the sounds that you're hearing. Um, what's on the other side? That's the inner ear, that is the cochlea. So the cochlea, and I think I have a better slide for this too, but essentially it's a snail shaped organ as we see right there. And it has about two and a half turns. In theory, you could unravel it and it would just be this long U. And let me see, I'm gonna to try to advance the slide. Hopefully nothing breaks here. Ah, there's a better image of the, the eardrum and how it connects to the bony chain. Captions are covering a little bit, but I, I'm a little scared to touch them. In any case, the surface to area ratio greatly amplifies the signal that one hears. And on the other end is the oval, well, the foot plate, which connects to the oval window. Okay, so I did talk about how the cochlea is two and a half turns. And beyond the cochlea yellow is this yellow area here. And uh, those are all of the nerves that are getting bundled that go upward towards the brain. And that's kind of the, the, the basis of how you start to pass sound through the auditory system. So this is a representation of the cochlea, if we could unravel it. It is tonotopically arranged. Good luck spelling that captioner. <laughs> and so the oval window, as we see here, that's where the stapes or the stirrup, that's where the stirrup is, that is plunging in and out of this window here. The cochlea is tonotopically arranged. In other words, it's arranged by frequency. So at the very entrance, those are the highest frequencies that you can hear. We go in all the way to the end where the apex is, that is where the lowest frequencies are that you can hear. So because the cochlea is fluid filled, we are causing ripples within the fluid. And what's interesting is that the cochlea has a floor as well. So it's not just like a hollow tube that has fluid in there, but beneath it are the hair cells that you may have heard of before. Those are the sensory cells of the ear. They're analogous to the rods and cones of the eye. And essentially what happens is depending on the frequency that you're hearing, the floor gets pushed down a little bit by these waves in certain areas. On the other side of the floor are these hair cells that stick upright and they get bent. Depending on how often they're bent, depending on the frequency, they will then transmit a signal. And there's thousands of these, so they all get grouped together and they form a nerve bundle and that goes up to the brain. So that's how you're able to perceive different frequencies within the cochlea. Oh, here's a cross section of the cochlea. So we can see if the cochlea is not, well, in its normal orientation, let's put it that way. When it's not unraveled, right, we can see these are the fluid filled areas. And then, ouch, <laughs> the hair cells are here in the middle. So as the ripples, the fluid pushes down and it pushes down on these hair cells that help us to perceive sound. If we look at the hair cells up close, there are two different types. I won't bore you too much with the details there, but basically we can see that the hair cells, they're called hair cells because they do have tiny hairs that depending on their position will give a different nerve firing pattern. And that's how you're able to excite those sensory cells in order to produce a nerve impulse. When we're all young and assuming there isn't anything going on through hearing, let's say as a nine-year-old or so, we have plenty of these hair cells. But as we age, hair cells can undergo different traumas, whether 
it's a lot of concerts you may have gone to. Maybe you were a musician and you played the violin really loud next to your ear. That can damage these hair cells. Eventually, hair cells get damaged to the point where they stop functioning. And I don't have the slide here. I should have brought it. But when the hair cells are damaged, they end up looking much like the plants in my garden do. They're flat on the ground. They haven't been watered in a long time. They look very sad. <laughs> a healthy hair cell will look upright, as we see here. So you can not see these by looking in the ear, of course. This is all done through microscopy and dissection and all of that. But it's just to show you what the inner workings of the cochlea are doing that are responsible for you being able to hear. So when I describe the cochlea to patients, I usually you know, mention that it's fluid filled and all of that, and the ripples act in the cochlea much like a floating dock would, where whenever a wave comes, the floor is moving with it too. So I, I found a great video. It kind of gives a demonstration of how it moves. Of course, right, this is a, it's an oversimplification and, but, we can see that as the waves move, the dock moves too. And depending on the amount of travel, it'll hit the hair cells at different, different intensities, I guess you could say, right? A louder sound will produce uh, a bigger wave. A smaller sound will produce a smaller wave. For example, if you heard a gunshot go off right by your ear, that can destroy your hearing instantly. Uh, because, well, basically you just flattened the hair cells completely. You stomped on them and they are done. So always good to avoid uh, a very intense, loud sound, especially one that's transient and happens in the fraction of a second. Okay, well, hopefully you have a little bit better idea about the structures of the ear, the external, middle, and inner ear, and how the hearing process works. So in clinic, what we'll do to find out what's going on in the middle ear, this work, oh, here we go, little signal issue, we'll use a tympanometer. And so what this does is we are able to move the eardrum back and forth by applying pressure as well as a little bit of vacuum. And we move the eardrum in a controlled manner to tell us what the status of the middle ear is, right? We know the middle ear is important to the hearing process because we want sound to pass through it as efficiently as possible. If there's anything that's slowing the signal down along the way, that can show up on the test results as a hearing loss, potentially. It doesn't always, but often it can. So that's the device that I use in particular. Well, the captions are blocking the probe that goes in the ear, but it's essentially a little silicone probe that goes down the canal. Yeah, so basically it's just a little silicone earpiece that we place in the ear. Hope that the airtight seal will maintain for a few seconds while we apply pressure as well as vacuum to measure the movement of the eardrum. It's this guy right here. That's the, the tip. There are different size tips, of course, because no one ever has the same size or shape of ear canals. So many tips to pick from. Oddly enough, almost everyone is the green one, but there are always variations without a doubt. So keeps my day interesting. Okay, might need to move the captions over to the bottom right corner. Maybe just to to see the top of the graph a little bit, but we're now looking at a screenshot of a right ear tympanogram. How do we know it's the right ear anyway? Well, we use different colors to indicate which ear we're working on. That's fine. Thank you. And so anyway, we plot the movement of the eardrum on this graph here, and the graph is called a tympanogram. What are we looking for, really? Well, okay, first things first, we wanna see, see my pointer, that's what we wanna see right now. Um, oh, shoot, wrong one. 
There we go. Okay. Huh, user error. All right. So we are looking for a peak as close to this zero line as possible. Why? Well, zero is the resting, is the ideal resting point of the eardrum. In other words, if it were on the positive side, the eardrum would be pushed out. If it were on the negative side, the eardrum could be sucked in. So there's a range of normals. You don't have to hit a perfect zero to be considered normal. So this is a very normal tympanogram in terms of where the eardrum lies when it's sitting in a neutral position. When it's sitting in a neutral position, that means it's free to move back and forth. It's traveling the distance that it should be traveling. Nothing is stopping it. So that makes it operate as efficiently as possible. Oh, we have a question here. I have no idea how to view it. <laughs> do I click it or do I go on or do we save it to the end or? Are we talking now or we have to wait to the end? We're good. Hello? You can, you can go ahead. So I was just, I don't think any of my audiograms or ear things have used a tempo tempo meter tempo meter and i was wondering is that something that just you do in your office or no 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 actually the tympanogram is done as a part of the standard test battery if you've gone to a hearing aid specialist hearing instrument specialist hearing aid dispenser it's all the same term or different terms for the same profession that's not within the scope of their practice. So they will not do that. They can't do it. It's not permitted to do that kind of testing. So either maybe you weren't shown your results, but if you went to an audiologist, this is done definitely because it can tell us a lot what to expect before we even start with the audiogram. Um, so not sure what happened there, but Sometimes when you get your results, they don't give you the graph. They just have the data points. So it might just say something like temp results. You might see like an A, a B, or a C even. So it's possible it might be there, but you may just not recognize what, what appears in the printout. Yeah, I guess I have to ask about that because I don't remember seeing any, any results from a Tim. Timpano, Timpano Graham. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Sure thing. Yeah. Well, so there's more to it than just the peak and where it lies. The other thing that we look at, I'm pressing the wrong button again. It's the top here. All right, there we go. We're not just looking at this line alone. It's just one aspect of the tympanogram. The other thing that we're looking at is the height of the peak. If, for example, it's really tall and it goes through the monitor, well, it's moving more than we would like to see. If it's only a very tiny peak, it's moving less than we would like to see. Either of those cases could show up as an inefficiency within the hearing test. So in case you're interested, well, what is the area that we should be looking for? Off on the right side, there's a data table here, and boy, that's really tiny. But in short, we're looking for a value that's equal to equal to or greater than 0 0.30. I'll spare you the units. We're at 0 0.48. That's fine. So we have a tympanogram that's moving the right amount. What that translates to, whether it's too tall or too short, if they're too tall, it's too loose. If it's too short, it's really tight and too difficult to move the eardrum back and forth. So we want it to move in a controlled manner. Think of uh, your garage door, right? It has springs on there, so it moves nice and easy. If the spring, if the spring breaks, it is exceptionally difficult to move that door. So we want to have it move, much like your garage door, in a smooth, controlled manner. Well, if it's not on zero, that's okay. We actually are at one. That's well within the range of normal. As I was taught, 
way back when in grad school, the range of normal goes from minus 150 to plus 100. Granted, if you're at plus 99 or, or minus 148, I wouldn't say that's normal. Don't worry, right? But, but we have plenty of people that are at plus 15 or minus 30 or minus 40, and that would also be considered normal overall. So we never really expect to see anyone have perfect zeros or be right on, you know, the, the edge of perfection that that's basically unheard of. I think I've had one this year who had perfect zeros, but you know, that, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're in the range of normal, that's all that matters. That's it. So that's a good thing. We also look at other values there's one that we look at that's called tympanometric width. So just to let you know, when we were looking at the graph, the first thing we looked at, that was the peak pressure of the tympanogram. That's how tall, or sorry, not how tall, what am I saying? It's where the peak lies. Is it in the positive, negative, somewhere in between maybe that's within acceptable range. We have a one here. The stiffness of the system is within the range of normal too. That's the next thing that we did. That's what's called static admittance. Again, the name doesn't matter too much. The other thing that we look at is what's called tympanometric width. All that is, is the total distance the eardrum moved from one extreme to the other. And if we have a value that's equal to or less than 125, we are good to go. Oops, it looks like we're at 80, I think. Can't quite see that. The next thing we'll look at is the ear canal volume. We want to have an ear canal volume that is within the range of normal too. Why would that matter? Well, it can tell us a few things. If, for example, we have a tympanogram that does not look like this, but one that's just a flat line, it tells me that the eardrum isn't moving. But ear canal volume can tell me why it's not moving. So in one example, if we had a flat line and, you know, of course, none of these values will appear because if you can't get it to move, then these will all be zero. But the ear canal volume might be something like seven. That's way too big for any normal ear canal. So what that tells me is that the eardrum has a perforation. And what we're doing is we're taking into account the volume of the middle ear space. That's why the eardrum can't move. No matter how much pressure we put, it's not going to budge. In a different example, if we had that flat line again, that means the eardrum still isn't moving, but maybe the ear canal volume is 0 0.1 or something ridiculously small. Well, does the person really have that small an ear canal? Highly, highly unlikely. Probably what happened is that probe bumped up right against the canal wall, and so we have an erroneous reading. In short, that's why the ear canal volume matters. We want to make sure it's within the normal range so that we can verify that the results that we have are, in fact, accurate, or it gives a reason for why the results may be out of the range of normal. What we do is we rate the whole tympanogram by a letter scale. It's not the grade scale. So this is what we would call a type A tympanogram. It's the ideal. It's moving the right amount. The eardrum is sitting in a neutral position. It's not sucked in. It's not pushed out. It's not too easy to move. It's not too hard to move. That tells us if there is a hearing loss present, the likelihood of it being caused by the inability of sound to move through the middle ear space efficiently, slim to none. Not totally impossible, but very unlikely. So that's the breakdown of the tympanogram. And that can tell us a lot, even before we begin the, the hearing test itself. Let's move to the next slide. We can see for the left ear, it looks different. They don't have to look exactly the same. That's fine. By the way, if you notice there are little jitters here, that's totally okay. That's fine. It's what we call artifact. It's the seal breaking and recapturing multiple times with the measurement window, and it's not considered diagnostic at all. 
So this is not unreasonable to see. There is nothing wrong with this whatsoever. What's the takeaway of this one? Well, first off, we know it's the left ear because it's color-coded blue. So red right, blue left. And even if we looked at all of the data points on here, here's the takeaway. It's a type A. It's the ideal. It's just as good as the right ear. So again, the middle ear is operating as efficiently as we could ever hope for it to operate. This is not age-related. It's the same standard whether someone is 80 years old or whether they're 15. It's all the same. So this is great to see. Okay, well, let's look at the audiogram a little bit. What we're looking at is this graph, and that's what's called an audiogram. Okay, so this graph is called an audiogram, and this is where we plot the results of the hearing test. It is arranged going from left to right by frequency. So on the left side, get my handy pointer here. On the left side, these are the lowest frequencies that we measure. All the way to the right side, these are the highest frequencies that we typically measure. The line at 20 and everything above it is the normal hearing range. The further we go down from 20 would indicate a greater degree of loss. Oh, there are a lot of symbols. What do they mean? That's a lot to take in for sure. So let's talk about just this one here in the end. E. The audiogram at 250 hertz shows that we have responses for the right and left ears at five decibels. Well, normal hearing, fantastic. We will start by measuring your hearing with insert earphones. And what we do is present a tone and we want you to be able to respond. But of course, we're looking for the absolute softest tone that you can hear, even if it's very faint, but you know you heard it. We ask the, the patient to click so that they can tell us what's going on or what they can hear but they have to be able to repeat their response. So we are always going to look for wherever a patient is able to respond at least two out of three times in the same spot. Wherever that occurs, we will plot the threshold with either a red circle or a blue X if we're testing the, depending on whether it's the right or left ear that we are testing. This is what's called air conduction. Essentially what happens is I'll push a button on the computer, the device will generate a tone, it comes out of the opening of the insert earphone, and then it's the eardrum to cause it to vibrate. And that's how you start to perceive sound. So these are the insert earphones that I use. The reason why I like to use them is they can be fantastic for isolating people from any other noises that might influence the outcome of the, the hearing test. Get rolled up and placed on the ear canal. Sometimes, if necessary, you might use a headset instead. Uh, but in general, these are better to use because we have a, a lesser chance of external sounds causing interference. The other thing that can happen is in a scenario where we have a difference between the right and left ear that is significant. So in any case, if we have a difference between the left and right ear, that's significant. If we need to test the poor hearing ear and present a tone that's, say, like 50 decibels worse than the right or then the opposite ear, let's say it that way, uh, then we run the risk of the sound being so loud that it actually vibrates your skull and transmits over to the opposite cochlea. What we do is we'll use 
earphones like this. You can use a headset that works too. The problem is something that's called an interaural in sorry, interaural attenuation value. What does that mean? Okay, well, when we use this type of earphone, the interaural attenuation value is about 65 decibels. In other words, the opposite ear has to be at least 65 decibels in intensity for it to cross over to the other cochlea. Most people don't have an asymmetry that's that large. It's pretty uncommon. If someone wanted to wear over-the-ear headphones instead, that intraoral attenuation value drops to about 45 decibels. We can have a problem if difference between the two ears is greater than 45. By using insert earphones, we can stop that completely. So that's how we test your hearing with these earphones. We'll move to the next slide. The other thing that we do is we'll test a different type of headset called a bone conductor. And so the bone conductor headset is actually placed behind one of the ears. So it only tests one ear at a time. We have to flip it over to the other ear if uh, we're gonna test that side. There shouldn't actually be anything in the ear. And when we present a tone through that headset, people will hear the beep. The reason why they can hear it is that, well, first off, it's, it's pretty tight, this headset, and it presses against the skin tightly. We want the sound to transmit through the skin, through the skull, and to stimulate the cochlea, the organ of hearing directly. So by vibrating the skull, we're causing vibrations inside the cochlea, and we're able to test the hearing of the individual at the cochlea. Now we know the results that we get. Well, well, let me say it better. We'll know that the results that we get are, are they're reflecting the true status of the cochlea. If the middle ear has an issue with pressure, sometimes that can show up as a hearing loss, but is the loss really just caused by this inefficiency or maybe it's an issue with the cochlea? or the nerve of hearing beyond. So that's why we'll do bone conduction testing. Show you what that looks like in the next slide. Okay, all right, yeah. So here's the audiogram again, and we've put an overlay off to the side because it helps to have people appreciate better what the hearing loss actually is. So normal hearing on the left side, and as it slopes down, it goes from a mild all the way to severe loss for the left ear, and for the right ear, a moderate to moderately severe loss on the right side. Okay, well, we know what the symbols mean for air conduction. It's a red circle and blue X for bone conduction. We'll indicate it with red arrow or a blue arrow. And so why do we do bone conduction? We will do bone conduction for any frequency in between 500 and 4,000 that has a threshold that's out of the range of normal. So anything below 20 gets done. And what we'll see here is at 1,000, the right ear bone conduction score and the left ear bone conduction score are all next to the air conduction scores. This tells us that the hearing loss that's there is a sensory neural hearing loss. This means that the loss is not caused by any inefficiency in the middle ear space. Rather, it is in fact an issue with the cochlea or the nerve of hearing beyond. As we move along, see some oddities here where the bone conduction score for the left ear is a little bit worse than the air conduction. In theory, that's impossible. The reason why is if we're taking a shortcut, it should not take as, or it shouldn't take longer than if we're going the long way around. 
going through the eardrum, through the middle ear to get to the cochlea instead of stimulating the cochlea directly. It's not a mistake by the, the person doing the testing. The bone conduction headset has to fit on top of a person's skin, right? We're not going to put it on someone's bone directly. Sometimes we have to put it on top of hair a little bit. We want the headset to stay put. So wherever it's going to stick, that's where we're going to start the testing. Also, the headset is one size fits most. So depending on what size of head you're putting it on, sometimes that adds a little bit of a boost because it's applying more pressure. Other times it might be a smaller head and maybe there's a little bit less pressure. So for any of these anomalies, we know if bone conduction is worse than the air, it's probably not true. They're probably equivalent to each other. Moving on, when we look at 2000, we'll see that the left ear is, we'll see the left ear is at 35 decibels for air conduction, bone conduction, also at 35 decibels. This is another sensory neural hearing loss. Then for the right ear, we'll see air conduction is at 55 decibels and Bone conduction is at 45. Wait, what? What's that symbol? Well, it's also bone conduction too. Okay. <laughs> well, it is and it isn't. So the bracket is bone conduction with a masker. And the masker is just static. And why do we do that then? So what happened initially was we had a red arrow right by, let me see if I can highlight it briefly, right by this blue X right next to it. It probably looked much like this one over here, but how do I know that's real? Because if we have a difference between bone and air conduction, that's 10 decibels or greater, I have to ask myself, do I really know that the ear that's responding is the one that I'm testing? Could it be the other ear? can't tell you for sure. Didn't I place it behind the correct ear? So isn't that the one that should respond? Yes. However, if you remember, the bone conduction headset vibrates your whole skull, and it's also vibrating the opposite cochlea too. So because we don't know which is the correct ear that's responding, we are going to keep the ear that we do not want to test busy by adding static to it. When we add static, that ear is now listening to the static. It can no longer hear the beeps. And at that point, we'll present the tone. If the patient doesn't respond, we'll keep making the tone louder to the point that when they do respond, we're going to stop presenting the tone at that, let's, let's say better. We're going to stop increasing the volume of that tone. Now, what we're going to do is increase the static volume, and we're going to do it in three steps. So if I increase the static by five decibels, present the tone, and the person responds, great. Now we're going to make it five decibels louder, the tone. Sorry, not the tone, the static. And we'll present the tone again, and if the patient responds, fantastic. We'll do that again a third time. The static is now another five decibels louder. The tone is still the same level. And if they respond, we will indicate that is their bone conduction masked or their masked bone conduction threshold. That is indicated with either a red or blue bracket, depending on which ear we are testing. Yes. So I've seen the term masked on my audiogram. And so I'm assuming if I'm not exactly clear, other people might not be clear. And I think that what you're saying is really important. Masking mean that one of the ears static in that ear to determine which ear is actually responding. Yes. It, so what, what we're doing by putting static in the ear that we do not want to test. Now, 
can confirm that the ear that we are testing is the one that is, in fact, responding. So long as the non-test ear is masked properly, if you have insufficient masking, if the static isn't loud enough, then we may not know, right? But if you know what you're doing, then it's not usually a problem. Uh, we will then know for sure that the ear that responded is the one that is, in fact, being tested. Did that answer the question? Okay, clear as mud. Okay, yeah. So in any case, we can see we have bone conduction, air conduction, bone conduction with masking, and that tells us a little bit more about the hearing loss that we have present. You could say, well, what we would never say actually is this person has 70% hearing. That is not really a good way to explain the audiogram at all. It's just wrong, really. The, the way we talk about the audiogram is by severity. We would say the because of the, the slight difference between the right and left ear, we can see at 2,000 that the right ear is worse than the left. The lower it is, the louder it is. And we'll see again at 6,000 that the left ear, and at 8, actually, the left ear is worse than the right. So there is some asymmetry here. I guess we would call this audiogram asymmetric. Then we would say the right ear has normal hearing, sloping to a moderate to moderately severe sensory neural hearing loss. The left ear has normal hearing all the way through, ah, uh, yeah, 500, sloping from a mild to severe sensory neural hearing loss. In short, we know that the hearing loss that's present is not really caused by the inability of sound to pass through efficiently. That being said, you might see some anomalies where the bone conduction is a little bit better than air conduction. Is that really an issue caused by the middle ear? Probably not. So if it's just too, probably it's not that significant. If we had a trend that was quite significant where there were three or more, four or more consecutive frequencies that all had this air bone gap, we would definitely say this is hearing loss with a conductive component. If the conductive thresholds are still in the, well, out of normal range, we would then call this a mixed loss because even at the best outcome, we still have an outcome that's not within the normal range of hearing. So that in a nutshell, tells us what's going on with this hearing loss here. Um, whenever we're programming hearing aid, no, we don't use these terms. We actually put the data points in there. This is more just to convey the overall trend of what we're looking at. Any questions so far? Oh, well, that's good. Okay. Um, I I think because you were talking or using some other kind of pointer, I didn't really get the bone conduction ones or the ones that are those little square things. Those are the test results for the bone conduction. Yeah, so if you can see the cursor here, these brackets yeah. are for bone conduction masked. So we'll have to put... Uh, a uh, static sound in the opposite ear, the non-test ear, to ensure that the uh, ear that we are testing is in fact the one that's responding. When we have uh, verified that the threshold is where it's supposed to be or that that we know that we, we have a threshold, then we'll indicate with a bracket instead of an arrow. So we all start with arrows first. Wherever there's a gap of 10 decibels, as we see here, or greater, we will then need to do bone conduction with masking. That helps us confirm that the ear that we test is, in fact, the one that's responding. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Well, let's see. What else do we have here? Yeah. So this is another... 
graph. I mean, the, the autogram is still the same. And so, okay, great. There's a hearing loss. So what? Right. Well, how does this affect one's ability to hear? One of the things that we use in counseling is where the sounds of speech lie. So on the left side of the graph, those are the vowels that give the power behind the words that we say. So they're usually pretty easy to pick out. In the middle of the graph, these are, well, mid-range sounds. And then on the right side of the graph, there are some that are missing here because they're covered. That's okay. Those are the high frequency sounds. They're the consonants that give the meaning behind the words that we say. So they're very soft and subtle sounds. A slight variation can change the meaning of the word completely. So, okay, well, what does this mean in relation to the audiogram? If we look at the left side of the audiogram, we'll see that the thresholds are way up here. And then these speech sounds are below them. In other words, they're significantly louder. So this individual should be able to hear these sounds easily, no problem. In the middle of the audiogram, the letters are kind of intertwined with the thresholds a little bit, somewhere below. That individual might have some difficulty with some of these sounds, unless the person speaks up enough. And then over here on the right side, which things are covered up, but the, the sounds are up here. Basically, oh, maybe we can move it. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so as I was saying, we have uh, high frequency sounds, Fs, THSs, SHs, Ks. They are high frequency sounds, but you can see that they are above the thresholds. And in this graph, higher is softer, lower is louder. So they're very soft sounds. Can this person hear these sounds? At this intensity, no, we would have to amplify them in order for them to perceive them. And that's where amplification can benefit the individual too, right? So this helps people to understand better that it's not just about making things louder, it's where you make them louder that counts because everyone has a different need of where they need it to be louder. Next slide. Ah, okay. Beyond the audiogram, we also do speech testing. And there are a few things that we do during the test battery. And I'll talk about them a little bit. So, all right. Yeah, first thing that we did, I don't know why it's really faint here, but we measure something called an MCL, most comfortable level. This is not a diagnostic test at all. Really, the only purpose is to figure out where to set my microphone so that the person that I'm going to test isn't straining to hear me, that they're not guessing at the instructions that I'm about to deliver, because if they have to guess, that defeats the purpose of everything we're going to do. So what we do here is we just play a passage to the patient. We start it off soft and have it gradually increase. And wherever it's comfortable, it's clear, all the words are audible. We instruct the patient to tell us to stop. And that's that's variable. Every person's going to be different. What we're not looking for is where someone just starts to hear it. That's not what we're after. We're not after how much someone can handle. That's definitely not it. It's somewhere in the middle where you could say, listen to a, a, a radio show and uh, uh, in your room without straining. It's just clear. You can hear everything easily. So... For example, this patient measured 50 decibels for both the right and left ear. 50 is soft conversational speech. So yeah, that's not unreasonable to see that. The other thing that we see is that the numbers are even. And even though it's not diagnostic, it tells me that I can likely expect to see an audiogram that is symmetrical. Maybe not fully, but you know, and we see there are some asymmetries here, but in general, it has a fairly symmetrical trend. So this is done before we begin anything on the audiogram at all. It's, this is done after tympanometry. By the way, when we're looking at the audiogram, one thing that I neglected to mention is that what we are looking for is symmetry between the left and right ears. In general, they should be very close to each other. 
we don't ever really anticipate to see a significant difference between the two ears unless there's something in the case history that would uh, tell us otherwise. So if you see something that is outside of the, the norm, then you know we might need to refer because that's not something that we would come across, right? We're never just going to see a singular line. So just to uh, reiterate again, what we're never going to see is just a flat line that goes straight across. That is unheard of. We're never going to see a singular line that goes across or that moves around in this pattern like that. That really doesn't exist. This is very typical. What we will see, they're together. Maybe they split apart. Sometimes they rejoin. Sometimes they flip around the other way. And that happened here. The left ear is better at one point. Now the right ear is better in higher frequencies. That's more common, although we don't expect to see a, as big a gap as we saw there. So moving on, I'm going to wrap up. The other thing that we do is, you know, with speech testing, we'll do what's called a speech reception threshold, an SRT. We faded here, but that's what that says. Essentially, what we do is we are presenting a word list of four words, and we're looking for the lowest level that the patient can repeat half of that for four word list back to me correctly. Wherever that happens, then we'll indicate with the, the decibel level, this person got 25 for the right ear, 20 decibels for the left, 30 is a whisper. The decibel scale is logarithmic. So every three decibel step doubles the power. So even five decibels is pretty significant and the rate of growth is never linear. So as the valleys go up, it gets quite a bit louder, but five decibels is the smallest uh, interval that we even measure or make any distinction. So you might say, so what? <laughs> what is the meaning of all this? Well, what we do is we compare it to the results of the audiogram at the frequencies of 500, 1000, and 2000. We add up the results for the right and left ear, average them out, and it produces what's called a pure tone average for the air conduction scores. The audiogram is down here, right? And so in short, the computer will do this automatically. We're looking for a difference of six to eight, even 10 at most between the pure tone average and the speech reception threshold. And so, we have 25, and I think that's 33, that's eight. Then we have 20 for the left ear, 27 for the pure tone average, that's great too. Excellent agreement. That tells us that the results from today can be considered valid and accurate. The patient wasn't falling asleep in the booth, nor were they just clicking nonstop. They were actually with me and they were faithful to the instructions. So this is not a diagnostic test, but this is a great it is a great cross-check that tells me that we have good data. If we have a mismatch, then we would likely have to recall the patient and test them again. The last thing that we do is diagnostic, and that's down here. That's what's called a word recognition score. If I present a word list of 25 words to the patient at a level that's loud enough for them to hear the words with relative ease, then we expect a reasonably high score. So how loud is loud enough? We add 40 to the SRT. Valleys right here. So 40 to 25 and 20. That gives a presentation level of 65 and 60, respectively, for the right and left ear. We'll add static to the other ear to ensure there's no way the other side is helping out in any way, shape, or form. And this person got 88%, one shy of an excellent score. So that's fantastic. In short, it tells us a few different things. First things first, it tells us that their nerve of hearing is intact and healthy. It's getting more or less the stimulation that it should expect to get. Over time with the hearing loss, you can actually start to get lower scores here, where let's say if this person said, oh, that's nice and all, but I don't think I want to wear hearing aids. Let's revisit this in 10 years. Maybe after five years, they come back and say, okay, please, let's let's get them. I'm not hearing so great. These 88s can become 70s, 60s. What this tells us and what we're measuring is also clarity of speech. So the higher the percent, the more clear speech is, the lower, the less clear it is. It can sound garbled. 
So even if we make things loud enough, it doesn't always mean that things can be made clearer. That doesn't mean that someone that has a low percent here is a lost cause. We still want people to be aware of their surroundings so they also can benefit from amplification. Uh, but the sooner we amplify, the more likely we are to preserve the high score. And also it slows down the rate of degradation that occurs within the audiogram. By not amplifying, this will continue to drop. We never know by how much, every case is different, but if the nerve is stimulated, then it's a happy nerve and the likelihood of thresholds dropping reduces significantly. Okay, ah, yeah. So for example, the computer will say something like, say the word carve, then the patient says carve, say the word send, they'll say send. In this example, the person said hip instead of hit, so that's a miss. And then I can't see the other one there, but that's basically what we're doing. We have the computer read the words because it's more accurate than me speaking through a microphone. It's more consistent. We're able to reproduce the results so that we have a consistent presentation level every time. So what you see on the right is just the word list of what we did. Okay, well, now what? Okay. <laughs> Just this is the last slide, I think. So there is a hearing loss. Well, are you a candidate? Are you not? That depends, right? What if you don't want to be? Well, that's okay, right? If you don't want to do it, you don't have to. I can never force anyone to do something they don't want to do. My job is to advise, and I can only present things uh, to the patient and give them their options. And then what they decide to do, that's up to them. If they do want to proceed, then usually we want to assess their needs. Are they in very complex listening environments? Are they very sedentary? Maybe they don't really socialize much. Maybe they're outdoors a lot. There's all kinds of things to consider too. The other thing too, of course, is that hearing aids do require work. They never just put them on and go. You got to clean them every day, ideally. They're not perfect in noise that can be very difficult. So we want to have realistic expectations, right? You won't have super hearing where you can hear down the street or anything like that. No matter what, you're always limited by the laws of psychoacoustics. A good rule of thumb is that if someone is more than six feet away, then there is no expectation that you should be able to understand everything that's being said to you. Oh, in short, not every task leads to amplification. The choice is yours. Thank you. Any other questions? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Or, uh, Are there any questions in the room or any questions on Zoom? Please raise your hand. Uh, yes. Question on Zoom. Hello? Please ask your question. Yes, what is a quick SIN, please? Yeah, so quick SIN is done often too, especially for patients that say they really struggle in noise. It's a uh, uh, SIN stands for speech and noise, right? So essentially what we do is we're able to measure the amount of difficulty that an individual has when they're in noisy environments based on the results of that testing. We're measuring a signal-to-noise ratio, uh, and if a patient is outside of an acceptable signal-to-noise ratio, then that's something else that we can use to, um, oh, what am I trying to say? We're, we're trying to give all the information to the patient that we can. It, it helps to put this difficulty in paper, right? It's not just that you're struggling in noise. Noise is difficult, but by how much exactly? And so that's why we do that kind of testing. So, so what are some normal ranges for that? I, I have a score of 7.2 decibels. Well, what does I, that mean? Oh, off the top of my head, I don't recall the exact range. I, if, sorry. <laughs> If it's within five decibels, so if if you have a signal to noise ratio of five, I think that's considered normal. 
outside of that, it means you might have some difficulty. So in other words, in order for you to just be able to hear within noise, you need a minimum of 7.5 decibels louder than the noise around you to hear better. Thank you. Well, um, I had a question. So you were talking about the different types in the tympanogram. Mm -hmm. And you only mentioned type A. What other type? How many types are there? And what are they? Oh, sure. Yeah. So there are other types, right? The other one that uh, is sometimes encountered is called a type C. That would be extreme negative pressure. Basically, the peak would be all the way to the left side. We would have a value of greater than 150 for negative pressure. The eardrum is sucked in. You might have a type B that's a completely flat tympanogram. In other words, there's no peak whatsoever. It's just not moving at all. In other words, the, the, the eardrum doesn't move, whether it's caused by an opening in the eardrum that is not allowing the pressurization to move the eardrum, or maybe there's fluid behind the eardrum. Fluid doesn't compress, so you'll get a flat panogram there. That can also be an indication of things. Maybe the bones are fused. That can happen as well. Additionally, you can also have a type A sub D, D for dominant. In other words, the peak is bigger than expected. It's a really tall peak. Other than that, everything looks good. So that's the one thing that sticks out. And you can have a type A sub S, S for shallow. The peak is present, but it's out of the range of normal. It's moving, but maybe a little bit stiffer than we would like to see. Okay, thank you. So any other questions in the room? Alan has a question, or is it somebody on Zoom? Oh, Stu, you'll be the last question. Go ahead. I, I have been probably seen by at least two dozen different audiologists, and sometimes they, you know, run the gamut of great, fantastic, really attentive, really, you know, just wonderful, like, you know, bedside manner and like just really help you go through with things. So, but one thing I would like to maybe get your take on is for someone who's new, who's never had a hearing test before, or who is just having their first or their second, what's like a couple red flags or one or two that really stand out that you think separates the great from the mediocre audiologists? I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that. <laughs> well, you know, I would say if, and this probably goes just for any practitioner in general, if they don't want to listen to you, right? You know, that's a big one. And that's why I operate the way I do, because I really dislike it when I go see my doctor or a doctor and one foot's already out the door and I can't even get through to whatever it is that I wanted to ask. And so that is a huge red flag. If they go fast, that's not really a red flag. Some places have to move very quick because they have a massive patient load or maybe they just need to be able to run those numbers through the door in order to pay for all the overhead and everything as compensation is very poor with insurance. Yeah, so I would say that's probably the biggest red flag of all or you know, maybe being overly pushy or, you know, making these promises or, or, you know, offers of, well, if you act today, then, you know, that, that, the, Ooh, that really doesn't fly with me. I really despise things like that. So you should never feel pressured or that you're not being listened to. I would say for me, that's probably the biggest red flag. Yeah, I mean, okay. one, one big red flag for me is when I, I can sort of sense that an audiologist is kind of pushing a particular brand because they, you know, either A, have just a better experience working with their customer service, but not necessarily is it the right equipment. They just sort of, you know, have a bias in that sense. So I like to try all the different things. Thank you for your answer.
Hey, so we have a few more things that we need to talk about before we close up our meeting. We'd really like to thank you for coming and you did a wonderful job and you're just a wonderful person. That's why you come to see us so that you find out what we say in our meetings and thanks. Thank you. So we give a big hand for Dr. Breitling. So now I'd like to go back and share our PowerPoint that oh, so when I brought Dr. Breitling's PowerPoint up, we lost ours. So I'll just tell you what we have coming up here. So this year is our chapter's 40th anniversary. And it's next month, we're going to have a celebration of our 40th anniversary. And we're also going to show the film Coda. And if you haven't seen that film, it's really wonderful. So hopefully we'll have it in this room as we planned. And it turns out that the last two meetings of this of 2024 are going to be two social events. So we have our, the anniversary party for our chapter. And then we also have um, December coming up. And historically, people in the past, we've had parties and things like that. And COVID really disrupted all of that. We're going to try and do that again this year. And in the past, we've provided some things, beverages and things like that. And then everybody brought their own personal cookie or something so that everybody could feel like they were involved in our celebration. I'd be remiss to not tell everybody that, uh, oh, the question in the room was, what is the name of the film? And the name of the film is CODA. And CODA means child of a deaf adult. Okay, so it would be a family that had people who identified culturally as deaf. And so if that were written out, that deaf would be with a capital D. If someone is late deafened and they were oral, like I am, I don't identify with a deaf culture and I don't know American Sign Language. If I ever said I was deaf, which I can say that sometimes because I have two cochlear implants and if I don't have my implants in, I can hear very little. Like I can hear if somebody slams a door really hard, I can still hear that, but I can't hear speech. I would use a lowercase d, deaf, because I don't know ASL or identify with a deaf culture. Okay, so this film is about a family that is deaf with a capital D, and one of the children is, has, can hear. And so it's all about their life with their family and engaging with the hearing world and how difficult that is and how we haven't really done everything that we possibly could do to be able to be inclusive of people in the deaf community. And there are examples in the film of government agencies that are required to provide accommodations for people with hearing loss, which includes the deaf community, and they're not doing that at all. It's a fabulous movie, a goosebump kind of movie, in my opinion. So we hope that all of you come. I'd like to remind everybody that one of the single biggest things that you can do once you have accepted that you have hearing loss, is to begin to ask for communication access everywhere you go. Many people do not realize that the Americans with Disabilities Act and other civil rights laws, both federally and within the state of California, cover disabilities. All state and local government, which is Title II, it's required to provide equal access to you for programs and services, and many of them aren't doing that. And if you don't ask for it, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. It's never going to get better. Jim Schroeder right here has been advocating in Venetia. They didn't have an ADA coordinator. They didn't have assistive listening systems that they're required to have hardly anywhere within the city within um, county regulated facilities as well. And I'm really happy to say Jim's been working on this, moving on three years and finally it's loosening up and some things are happening. 
You got to be dog determined and just keep working on him. But if we don't ask, we, I can't tell you, Jim can't, I've gone with him on some things. People are telling us, you're the first person who ever asked. They held a meeting recently in a veterans hall. There's a sign on the wall that there's an assistive listening system. Nobody ever knew anything about it. Nobody could find it. They're saying, oh, nobody ever asked. So we don't know whether nobody ever asked. But I'm, I'm thinking there's a good chance that nobody did ever ask. So I'm reminding all of you, you got to exercise that you know, that courage muscle to ask for what you need. Sometimes it might be an assistive listening system. Sometimes it could be asking your doctor to use a speech to text app like Ava. Could ask them to have it on their phone so that when they're talking, when they're typing things into their computer, when they're looking away from you, if they had the app open and you had that app on your phone, you could read what he was saying on your phone. We have a couple of committees that we're always open to having people join us on. All of you know I'm a dyed-in-the-wool advocate, so I'm the chair for the advocacy committee. And most people really don't like to do that. And one of the reasons I think they don't like to do that, Jim was having a conversation with me recently about how to talk to somebody. That he didn't want to come at them full barrel, full bore, with all these things that they aren't doing. I communicated to him that I believe that we work best with people that we like, that we work well with, that we have relationship with. So a part of our advocacy e efforts are always building relationship with somebody so that you may get to a place where, because they're not taking any action, that you become much more aggressive because the law is on your side. But up until you get to that point, the hope is that somebody thinks, wow, that person's calling me up. And every time I talk to them, I get better at my job. Every time I talk to them, our community gets better. Our intention in the community that we live is that everybody can participate. And so Jim was like really relieved is like, oh gosh, you mean, I? and I said, no, I, I don't think that that works very well. So I'm just saying that today to help all of you as you're thinking about what you need to do going forward. So Herr Chiba, our vice president, is the chair of the programs committee. We meet once a month, there are like four or five of us. Anybody is welcome to join us. We look for new ideas I've been doing this for a really long time. It's hard to come up with new um, topics that people who have been members for a long time haven't heard before either. So we really welcome your ideas and your input. Well, we have a few more minutes and, and then our captioner is gonna leave us. I'd like to thank our captioner for being here today. You're our, other than the assistive listening system in the room, you're really our lifeblood to being able to understand fully within our meetings because we rely on you for what we can't understand. So I really want to thank you today. Does anybody have any last minute news that they're doing, any, anything that we haven't talked about yet? And Right before we call on you, if you raise your hand, I want to make sure that everybody in the room knows that all of the literature here is for you to take if you haven't already taken it because you came to a previous meeting. We have samples of HLAA magazines here. When I bring the things to the meeting, I would really like it all to be gone so I don't have to carry it home. So please don't be shy. So does anybody have any last minute thing that they need to, that they would like to communicate with us? Okay, thanks for coming. We hope to see you again next time. So we're at our five minute mark. Um, our captioner is probably going to leave. I have a few assistive listening devices that I happen to bring to the meeting that 
to show the people who are here, you know, we always run over. <laughs> we extended our captioning time 15 minutes and here we go again. So this particular device, I keep being reminded over and over again when I visit other chapter members. So I do house calls. Oh, need help with their technology. They need help figuring out how to get other gadgets and things. And you now I was born with the helper gene. What can I say? So this particular device is a doorbell alerting device. And one of the reasons that I happen to really like it is that it's really portable. It's like this big puck thing, and you can buy more than one of them. So if you had different locations in your house that you wanted it, you could have one in every location. So I tend to, when I get up first thing in the morning, not put my cochlear implants on. I have my coffee. I read the newspaper. I usually don't put them on until after I take my shower. I get up before my husband, and in the interim between when I put my cochlear implants on, I use the speech-to-text app, Ava, to communicate with my husband. So he's talking to me, and I can't hear a word he says, and I get my phone out and turn it on, and I can completely understand him. So if somebody happened to ring my doorbell at the same time, when I don't have my processor on, I couldn't hear that. But I can see that. So I'm doing this in the room. We still have a few people who are um, on Zoom. So you can see this flashes. So I don't anticipate somebody's going to ring my doorbell at 7 o'clock. But I do know Amazon delivers at 8 o'clock. So if I know that I have a, and on the side of this is a little button, you just press it and you turn it off. So I have two of these. I can program them to be different colors. So theoretically, if you had a front door and a back door, one color could be the front door, one would be the back, and you would know where the person was for the, the door. These are available on Diglo. You can see technologically, they're very simple. Nothing complicated for anybody. Another thing I brought today was because we talk about it, but we're fortunate here that we have a hearing loop and through time, almost everybody who's attending the meetings has a telecoil and has it activated. But if you go to a location that has an FM or an infrared, the way that that is hearing aid compatible is with a neck loop. And this is what a neck loop looks like. And this part goes around your neck. And this part plugs into the receiver. Both the FM and the infrared has a receiver. So I'm going to walk over here and get a pick up a hearing loop receiver. And I'll just show you because the FM receiver is really quite similar. So those of you who are on Zoom, hang on one second. So an FM receiver doesn't look much, may not look much different than this hearing loop receiver. There's some kind of box. The most basic ones are like this. that looks about like an old pack of cigarettes. I mean, most of us are old enough to remember what cigarette packets look like. And all of these devices have an audio port on them. See the round port that's kind of metallic on the bottom? Well, that round port takes the end of turned off the microphone thank you so you would put the neck loop portion around your neck and activate your telecoil and the loop part around your neck is the piece that connects with a telecoil in your hearing aid. And then you were to receive the sound there. And Tina, have you been to the chamber in Danville to find out if the new FM there works? Oh, no. 
So we have that to do. I'll contact you. Maybe we'll go at the same time. So we've been the a town near where Tina and I live. Tina actually lives there, and I live like, you know, a hair's a breath away. And there was a big article in the newspaper about how they were upgrading the audio video system there and that they were installing a state of the art hearing assistance. Well, we contacted them and they decided that they were installing an FM and they didn't ever contact one single person in the hard of hearing community for input as to what they were installing or even call us after we contacted them about that to ask us to come test it out. So that was a, a personal conversation here. Okay, so does anybody else have anything to say? Any news? Okay, so see you next time. Thanks for coming. Bye.